So Prince Andrew is all over the news and you've probably seen his recent interview about his relationship with Jeffrey Epstein. But the big question is whether Prince Andrew is lying or telling the truth. So today I'm going to go through the art of deception and what you need to look for to tell if someone is lying. We'll go through Prince Andrew's body language, his facial expressions and even some of the words that he used so you can make your own decisions. Now, if you're new to my channel, I'm Sue Blackhurst and I bring the world of social psychology into everyday language. So if you're fascinated by human behaviour and love learning about yourself and the people around you, what have you got to lose? Subscribe to my channel now and don't miss my weekly videos out every Monday and every Thursday. Now, I'm not sure there's many people out there who have never told a lie. From those tiny white lies to those great big lies that get you in and out of relationships, employment or even police custody. Because for some people, lying is really hard and as soon as they open their mouths, it's plainly obvious that things just don't add up. However, for others, with practice, telling lies becomes a way of life, even to the extent that they often believe their own stories. So let's take a child, for example, playing happily and they knock over an expensive ornament and it smashes on the ground. And then mum, dad, whoever, come home and see the debris on the floor and ask the child if they've touched the ornament. To which the child says no. But what happens now is a series of facial expressions and changes in body language and the words that the child uses. That as an experienced adult, we can see straight through the child and we know quite easily that the child is lying. But these micro expressions and visual clues aren't random and they're not dependent upon gender, race or nationality. These are universal clues and what the brain is truly thinking but the body is trying to suppress. So as parents we've seen this look so many times that we have learned what it means but as the child gets older they also learn how to mask and manage these expressions and by the time they're adults when we're asked about something that we want to deny we're now far more able to say the opposite of what really happened and with so much conviction that we get believed. Now the reality is that there's no 100% sure way to tell if someone is lying. If there was, then we'd have no need for the courts, judge and jury. So we can't ever say with complete certainty whether someone is lying or telling the truth. But what we can do is look at all the clues and make our own personal assessments. And by learning what signs to look for, it can help us form our own personal opinions when dealing with other people. So let's look at some subtle clues and signs and behaviours that might be linked to deception. But it's really important to add that this is not a movie with a plot or a storyline where we have to identify who did it. So our assessment of Prince Andrew's interview is merely to form a personal opinion and not to make a conviction. We saw a one hour interview and there is so much more than this when it comes to interrogation. But I do think that these clues will shed some light on identifying deception in others. So the first thing I want to run through is something called congruence against incongruence. Now what congruence mean is when the words and the thoughts and the observable body language all match. So when somebody's speaking to you, what they say, how they look and how they say it all seem to match and seem to work together. Against incongruence where there's a little bit of discrepancy. So imagine somebody, a very good friend has their hair cut completely different and they come towards you and say, do you like it? Congruent behaviour is where you look at them and go, wow, you look fantastic, I love it. Incongruent behaviour is, is where somebody says, um, yeah, it's really nice, um, I love it. So the words might be there, but you can tell that there's some discrepancy in the body language. So when we're looking today at the art of deception, what we're looking for is the congruent behaviour against incongruent behaviour. Now there are quite a few non-verbal signals and associated reactions that could indicate that someone is lying to you. Some are caused by nervousness, because have you ever been to a very high pressure job interview or maybe a hot date and thought to yourself when you walk out, why did I just say that? Uh, that's the pressure. Others are caused by chemical reactions and you cannot hide or mask physiology. So for example, you're alone in the house at night, you hear a sudden noise downstairs and in an instant adrenaline is secreted and an unstoppable reaction commences. 
your heart is racing, your breathing becomes shallow as your lungs are trying to get more oxygen to the muscles, getting you ready for the fight or flight. And you begin to sweat, assuming that you're able to sweat. So this is a chemical reaction that we cannot hide or mask or control. Now there are also physical reactions as our body and hands move and shift to either support or fight against the words coming out of our mouths, which leads me back to congruence and incongruence. Because it's really important to understand at this point that we can't ever conclude whether a person is actually lying or not. People who exhibit any one of the following traits that we're going to go through may well be telling the truth. It's all about clusters, because as much as folding your arms doesn't mean that you're being defensive, it might mean that maybe you're cold or it's just comfortable. But add a whole host of other mannerisms, such as facial expressions, and maybe the way you say certain words, and the opinion of being dismissive becomes far more valid. So let's have a look at the interview with Prince Andrew. Now I'll run through various aspects, but I'm going to give you the tools to analyze the video for yourself and therefore you can make your very own assessment. Let's start off with non-verbal communication and let's look at facial expressions. You've chosen to speak out for the first time. Why have you decided? to talk now. So let's start off and we're looking at facial expressions. Now one of the great things to use for picking up deception is watching the eyes um, and it's rapid blinking because on average we blink probably five or six times a minute but if people are under pressure or if they know they're lying this blink rate will increase and if you look here when Prince Andrew is asked certain questions or when the name Jeffrey Epstein is mentioned what we do see is this rapid blinking. Because uh, there is no good time to talk about um, Mr Epstein and um, all things associated. Um, and all of this goes back to your friendship with Jeffrey Epstein. Mm. How did you... Close friends. I mean, we were friends because of other people. Um, and I had a lot of... But I didn't have much time with him. I suppose I saw him... So here we have micro expressions because Prince Andrew's been asked a question. Now he's answering yes, but if you look at his head, he's very subtly shaking it, saying no, which is saying to us that his brain is saying one thing, but he's trying to overpower this by giving us a different answer by saying yes. And if you watch throughout the video again, you'll see he actually does this on several occasions. Was that his appeal then? Was yeah. that what you, because you, you were perceived by the um, uh, but then after I got married, I was um, very happy um, and, and, and I've, I've never really... him as a good friend. Did you trust him? Uh, uh, yes, I think I probably did. But uh, again, um, I mean... <laughs> So here we have an element of damage limitation because Prince Andrew has been questioned about Epstein's invites to both Windsor Castle and to Sandringham. Now two things strike me here. One is making it perfectly clear that this had nothing to do with the royal family, quite rightly. But secondly, I think he's trying to point out that his friendship was not with Epstein himself. It was still back down to his girlfriend. So he's trying to detach himself from an involvement with Epstein, keeping that bond and that linkage with his girlfriend. He was your guest as well. In 2000, Epstein was a guest at Windsor Castle and at Sandringham. He was brought right into the heart yes, of the but, royal family at your but, invitation. But uh, certainly at my invitation, not at the royal family's invitation, but remember that it was his girlfriend that was the key element in this. He was the, as it were, plus one to some extent. In, in, that, in that. Something you, you threw. One of the measures that people use when they're trying to identify deceit is actually looking how people differ from their normal day-to-day -day behaviours. One thing that strikes me here is when he's questioned about this party that apparently he threw with Epstein, um, is the way that Prince Andrew actually says the word no. Now, there are various ways of saying the word no because if people are trying to deceive, they will often say no and maybe look in a different direction so they won't make eye contact with you. Or they may say no and close their eyes and this is a form of blocking. By closing their eyes, they're trying to keep the question out and they don't want to hear it or they're trying to hold back some information and so it's not released. They may say no after a long hesitation, and this is what I see is going on here. 
or they can say no and stretch the no over a long period of time. So it's very much a case of, uh, no, I don't think that happened. And again, let's see what happens here. Um, or they can also say no in a bit of a sing-song manner. So it's like, no. Um, that also are signs that what the person is saying isn't quite true. A, a birthday party um, for Epstein's girlfriend, Galen Maxwell at Sandringham. No, it was a shooting weekend. A shooting weekend. Just a straightforward, straightforward shooting weekend. Stayed with him, you were a visitor, a guest on many occasions at his homes, mm. and nothing struck you as suspicious? Nothing. During that whole time? Nothing. In 2006, in May... Now, touching the face, especially the mouth area, is a great indicator that something just isn't quite right because the hand starts to work a little bit unconsciously and it tends to go to the mouth area to try and prevent the words from coming out. An arrest warrant was issued for Epstein for sexual assault of a minor. Now this one's quite interesting because lapses in memory are also great things to watch out for, especially if the conversation has previously flowed quite smoothly. Because when this sudden vagueness sets in and the subject is trying to recall events, this does signal that the person's been hit with something that maybe they just need a little more time to think about what they're going to say. And it's this hesitation of, oh, let me see, I'm not quite sure, let me try and repeat the question and recall events. It gives them a way of buying more time. But even so, at the time, I don't think I... Um, certainly I wasn't aware when the invitation was issued what was going on in the United States. And I wasn't aware until, until the media picked up on it, because he never said anything about it. He never discussed no, with you the fact discussed it that an arrest warrant had been issued. No. So he came to that party knowing police were investigating him. Well, I'm not quite sure whether it was it police that were... I don't know, you see, this is the problem. It was the Palm really Beach Police at the time. But I mean, I'm afraid, you see, this is the problem, is that an awful lot of this was going on in the United States and I wasn't a party to it and I knew nothing about it. Now, eye blocking is where the eyes remain closed for maybe more than a second. But if you think about it, if we block something, we generally want to keep something either out or in. So the action of this long blink can be associated with either shutting the question out because you don't want to listen to it, or maybe holding in the immediate response. Now, this extra second of the closed eyes gives the person that fraction of time to think and try and formulate a response before they just blurt out an automatic answer. It's one of those things that somebody's going through that sort of thing, well, I'm terribly sorry, I can't be... Um, so no contact. Sitting. No contact. Uh, when, when... Now indifference. Now indifference could be seen as looking like you're not bothered um, and people can perceive that to be um, that it actually isn't concerning you. Where in fact, things like shrugging of shoulders or lack of expression or a lazy posture. Now these can be signs that somebody's lying because what they're doing is they're trying to convey no emotions at all. So then they're not gonna give anything away, um, any of these tell signs. Now, on top of that, we have overthinking. So if the person seems to be thinking too hard to fill in the details of a story, maybe that is because there aren't any details that they can talk about, and therefore they're trying to recreate them in order to deceive you. That was December of 2010. Yep. He threw a party to yep. celebrate his release, and you were invited as no, the guest of honour. Oh. In 2010, that there wasn't certainly wasn't a, a, a party to celebrate his release in December, because it was a small dinner party. There were only eight or ten of us, I think, at the, at the, at the dinner. If there was, a, if there was a party, then I'd know nothing about that. You were invited to that dinner as a guest of honour. Well, I was there, so there was a dinner. I don't think it was quite. As, as you might put it, but yeah, okay, I was there for a, <laughs> I was there at a dinner, yeah. I'm just trying to work this out because you said you went to break up the relationship and yet you stayed at that New York mansion several days. I'm wondering how yeah, long... But I was doing a number of other things while I was there. But you were staying at the house of yes. a convicted sex offender. It was a convenient place to stay. You have to, you have to understand that, 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 that his house... I, I described it more as a, as, a, as, a, as a, almost as a railway station, if you know what I mean, in the sense that there were people coming in and out of that house all the time, 
Um, what they were doing and why they were there, I had nothing to do with. So I, I'm afraid I, I can't make any comment on that because I, I, I really don't know. One of Epstein's accusers, Virginia Roberts, yeah. has made allegations against you. She says she met you in 2001. She says she dined with you, danced with you at Tramp Nightclub in London. She went on to have sex with you in a house in Belgravia belonging to Gerlen Maxwell, your friend. Now the steepling of hands indicates confidence and this is something that you often see used by politicians and leaders. But discrepancy can occur here because the confidence doesn't always guarantee accuracy because the steepling of fingers allows the person to deliver incorrect information but in a confident way. But here we have incongruence because when you think and feel something that is a against what you're saying you have this inner stress and it's fighting to get out and what can happen is the thumbs begin to get a bit twitchy as you try to restrain them we get a bit of a battle going on which is another visual clue that things might not be as they seem your response i have no recollection of ever meeting this lady none whatsoever you don't remember meeting her no. So finally, I just want to reiterate that there is no foolproof form of lie detection. When it's a criminal case, there's a whole host of methods used to try and deduce what really happened. But when you're faced with somebody in front of you and you are uncertain whether they're telling you the truth or a lie, remember that these are only guides and need to be seen in clusters rather than in isolation in order to be valid. Now, in addition to that, it's also really important to use and trust your instinct, as gut feeling is there for a reason. So I hope this week has not only helped you have a look at Prince Andrew, but also a little bit for your personal life as well, and maybe working with people you know. Don't forget, subscribe to my channel now. You can see last week's video up here, and new videos out every Monday and every Thursday. Thanks again for watching. Bye-bye.